Greetings and salutations. Hello, friends. We are up to Blood of Olympus. I'm actually really not looking forward to this. I don't like this book much. I always find it very disappointing and it doesn't have much Percy and Annabeth. And I'm an awful person and that upsets me deeply. So I've kind of been dreading this one a little bit. I'm doing it for you. I'm doing it for you guys. It's not that bad. I'm being dramatic. Once again, fucking hideous cover. The American Blood of Olympus cover, which I do have, thankfully, is one of the prettiest things I've ever seen. What is this? Do you want to really tell me any of those are members of the Seven? Really? But basically, I'm not having a good night and nothing is really distracting me from my brain tonight. So I figured, well, we'll jump into my least favorite book in my favorite world and see how, how we do with that. So I may not read for long tonight just because I don't know how well my brain is gonna hold attention, but I figured we'd give it a shot. So <laughs> let's go. To my wonderful readers, sorry about that apology for that last cliffhanger. I'll try to avoid cliffhangers in this book. Well, except for maybe a few small ones, because I love you guys. That's really cute. That is a really cute little thing. I like that we have the prophecy almost immediately as well, just to jog your memory in case you've forgotten. Fun fact, my local bookstore, and I've never seen them do this for like any other book, but they had like a full setup for Blood of Olympus when I came out. I didn't buy it from there uh, when the actual release date happened. Fun fact, I actually got Blood of Olympus early because I went in about four days before it was released to pre-order it. And I got a phone call about 20 minutes later before I, oh, my mum did because I was a child at the time. That, they had it in stock. Did we want to come pick it up? And we did. And then um, they weren't meant to do that because it was, they they had them in stock, but they weren't on sale yet, but we got it early. So I got to read it early. But when I went to the bookstore like a week later, they had this whole, whole section where they had like the prophecy written on the wall and they had a bunch of copies of this and every book in the series. And they had like, like orange, like cellophane everywhere. It was, it was really cool. It was really cool. I've never seen like a little celebratory thing for Percy Jackson before and I've never seen that specific bookstore do that for any other series. So it was really cool. Okay, but I actually really want to cosplay the the like serving maiden Annabeth look with like the Drakenbone sword underneath um, because I think about this this look all the time. I don't know, I just think about this scene a lot. I <laughs> like that specific look. So if anyone Piper cosplayers want to cosplay this with me, hit me up. <laughs> Over the past few days, every time Jason sacrificed a portion of a meal to Jupiter, he prayed to his dad to help Nico. This is why I love Jason Grace so much. You can say a lot of things about Jason Grace that I think are valid criticisms. You can complain about the fact that we don't actually see him do that much heroics, that this is something that I very much I believe in, that Rick writes him as if he is like kind of an equal player to Percy, but doesn't ever actually put that in action. We don't ever actually really see Jason being as powerful. He occasionally has powerful moments, but he does spend a lot of fights knocked out. And I think a lot of that has to do with Rick not really knowing how to write Jason, if I'm honest. Those are all valid criticisms, but Jason just not as a hero, as a character and as a friend, I think is so compelling and so lovely. And I do really adore Jason Grace. Percy had stayed aboard to watch for threats from the sea, but he hadn't liked the idea of Annabeth going on this expedition without him, especially since it'd be the first time they were apart since returning from Tartarus. He'd pulled Jason aside. Hey man, Annabeth would kill me if I suggested she needed anybody to protect her. Jason laughed, yeah, she would, but look out for her, okay? Jason squeezed his friend's shoulder. I'll make sure she gets back to you safely. You can see that Percy kind of knows that it's unhealthy how protective he is over Annabeth because he is doing this behind her back, but Percy, I understand him needing that, that needing that reassurance, knowing for a fact that someone is looking out for Annabeth, is going to keep an eye out and try their best to get Annabeth back to Percy. It's a, it's a clarification thing. It's a comfort thing. It's a reassurance. But little bit of his unhealthy protectiveness coming in here. We explore it a little bit in this book, but not very much because obviously we don't have Percy and Annabeth POVs, which I know Rick has explained why I still think we should have got Percy and Annabeth POVs here. While Rick makes the argument that like Percy and Annabeth's story and their arc is to take a step back and let other people kind of be the main heroes for once, we spend so much of this series um, focused on Percy and Annabeth and Percy and Annabeth being major players that them not even having POV chapters right at the end just to, to close the series feels really weird. It makes their story feel very incomplete. I have talked to friends about this before who agree so I don't think it's just me who feels this way but Percy and Annabeth's story just feels so open-ended because their ending in House of Hades is not actual it's not an actual ending and so kind of hearing them have plans for the next summer through Nico's point of view at the end doesn't really feel like an ending for them and so their, their story feels very open-ended even though they're such an integral 
focus of this series. It's just odd they should have had at least a few POV chapters just at the end. Anyway, anyway. Foolish girl, who let you back from Tartarus? A titan, my lord. And I left it ahead apologetically. I'm upset. Use an urn, use an some form of some remnant of Jason's mum's spirit to manipulate him. Bit of a dick move. Bit of a dick move. You don't go for the dead mum. You don't go for the dead mum. Hey mum. Dead. No. Not the time. Ashley Taylor get through one fucking video without singing show tunes challenge. That was why, as much as it chafed him, Jason followed rules. He kept his promises. He never wanted to abandon anyone the way he'd been abandoned and lied to. I feel like Jason Grace, if he was my friend, he would be very patient with me and my abandonment issues and would always be very okay with reassuring me that he wasn't going anywhere and he would always be there for me and wow, maybe I want Jason Grace to be my best friend. Maybe I want him to be my bestie. It wasn't her, he said. At least no part of her I could save. There was no other choice. Annabeth took a shaky breath. No other right choice, maybe, but a friend of mine, Luke, he, his mum, similar problem. He didn't handle it as well. Her voice broke. Jason didn't know much about Annabeth's past, but Piper glanced over in concern. I love the implication that Annabeth has confided in Piper about everything that happened with Luke. That shows a real trust um, between Piper and Annabeth that I love to see Annabeth really opening up and having those strong female friendships means a lot to me. But also, yeah, Luke didn't handle everything with his mum well. There are other ways to handle things, and Jason Grace is an example of this. Annabeth Chase, as charming as ever. Yeah, well, Annabeth said, I just got back from Tartarus, so my manners are a little rusty. Especially towards the goddesses who you wiped her boyfriend's memory, made him disappear for months, and then, honestly, child, are we going to rehash this again? Aren't you supposed to be suffering from split personality disorder? Annabeth asked. I mean, more so than usual. Annabeth Chase literally not giving a fuck about how powerful Juno slash Hera is and literally just giving her so much shit and being so blunt with her is everything to me. Annabeth Chase is everything to me. Also, fuck you, Hera. She'd expected some backlash. It happened every time she shared her strength. But she hadn't anticipated so much raw anguish from Nico D'Angelo. She sat down heavily, just managing to stay conscious. Gods of Rome. This was only a portion of Nico's pain. How could he bear it? Nico D'Angelo happy era when, when, when can we get this kid some serotonin? Hedge cleared his throat. You sure those aren't Dalmatians? They, they look like Dalmatians. Maybe if they were Dalmatians, they could push some people off a cliff for you. <laughs> Kill someone's mom for you. It's a little, little bit of Disney, Disney humor. I am a Cruella stan. I bought a Cruella pop vinyl today. Please don't think I'm shading Cruella. I actually really loved it. <laughs> Say what you will about me, but I think Cruella is the best live action Disney film since Cinderella. <laughs> Octavian disobeying Raina's orders and just still fucking going forward with like the assault and Kim Half-Blood. What a piece of shit. What a little shit. I really do think Octavian could have been a really, really interesting villain had Rick taken the time to really develop his character and do more with his character. We really don't see that much of Octavian in these books realistically. And so we don't know or understand him that deeply. And I think he could have been a really, really interesting villain and a really like iconic villain in the same way that I think Lucas Stalin is one of the best written uh, villains in, in any kind of like middle grade fiction. I think Octavian could have been the same, but Rick just didn't really take the time to develop his character enough. And so it doesn't feel like we ever knew Octavian or understood him that well but I think the groundwork for a really interesting character is definitely there and like just in this little dream sequence with Raina where we see Octavian being like the worst we really see that groundwork and I just I wish we delved into his character a little more I'll be honest but that's fine bit bold of Octavian to think that he can just find a different way to defeat Gaia and ignore the prophecy when he's meant to be an oracle he lacks some brain cells, is what I'm saying. <laughs> Raina heads and Nico having a hunter like follow them around just slowly in the background having that threat there. It's giving me very much Empire Strikes Back. It's giving me very much Boba Fett and Empire Strikes Back and I'm enjoying it. Hazel immediately noticing that something is off with Leo when he got back and just being like, come on, tell me. And like being a constant and being really, really open and letting Leo talk to her about what he'd been through and then being like, all right, I've got a drawer. Tell me what she looks like. That's so sweet. 
I love Hazel so much. She is so precious. I adore her. Here we have the passage that is one of like maybe five moments of this book that I remember reading for the first time really clearly. Percy was eating a huge stack of blue pancakes. What was his deal with blue food? Well, Annabeth chided him for pouring on too much syrup. You're drowning them, she complained. Hey, I'm a Poseidon kid, he said. I can't drown, and neither can my pancakes. I remember reading that specific passage and putting down my book and like just kind of like dancing around my bedroom a little bit because it was the first moment of Percy and Annabeth together. And obviously when you're reading these books as they get published, it'd been a year since I'd seen them and they are my comfort characters and they're my comfort ship. And so seeing them just have a tiny little moment like that it just made me so happy hearing the mention of blue food. It was just this moment of like, your best friends are here, your home. And I remember texting Taylor um, because I was doing like a live text without spoilers um, because she hadn't got the book yet. Cause again, I got it early. Just texting her being like, there was just a little purse birth moment and I'm literally crying because I miss them so much. And I did cry. That made me cry the first time I read it. I just remember it really clearly of just like how happy that moment made me because it felt like I was catching up with friends. Like I just missed them so much. And that was this moment where I kind of felt like I got them back to me. This is why I wish there was passing out of my POVs in this book because we get a few crumbs of Percy Beth moments, but considering how long we have loved those characters and how long we have followed their story, them not getting a proper ending here is really upsetting. It like is painful to me a little bit. Leo skipped a stone across the river. He wished Hazel and Frank would get back. He felt kind of awkward hanging out with Percy. I mean, for one thing, he wasn't sure what kind of small talk to make with the guy who'd recently come back from Tartarus. Catch that last episode of Doctor Who? Oh, right you were trudging through the pit of eternal damnation. I remember being so excited about that line because this book came out in my peak Doctor Who phase. So that reference meant a lot to me. There was also In Magnus Chase, which was the next year. Um, So I was still in that peak Doctor Who phase. There was a mention of like something looking like a Dalek. And again, made me very, very excited. We love references to other fandoms popping up in here. It's like in the last few Trials books when there would be like Marvel references or even Percy makes a Marvel reference in the first Trials book too. Like those Marvel references there or Taylor Swift being referenced and mentioned in Magnus Chase. It's just very exciting to me. I just love my other fandoms popping up in these books. The only thing they had in common was Calypso, and every time Leo thought about that, he wanted to punch Percy in the face. See, that really bothers me. Percy literally did not do a single thing wrong, and Leo should know that. I know that Leo and Percy aren't close, and he's just talking here about how much, like, he already found Percy intimidating, and now it's even worse, and he struggled to think of them as even on the same team because they never went to camp together, blah, blah, blah. But they are still on the same team. Leo knew Percy first. They had some kind of friendship blossoming first. Leo should have some kind of empathy and understanding for Percy but also he should just understand there was a reason the other heroes couldn't stay. That Leo couldn't stay himself. Percy already had Annabeth in his life. It was a different situation for him and I would like to think, I love Leo, I would like to think of Leo as a character who has the emotional understanding to empathize with that and not get mad at his friend because his friend heard a girl Leo liked once even though Percy did nothing wrong. What if we from where I did like Adidas shoes? Percy wondered, would that make Nike mad enough to show up? I love Percy, his dumb little jokes. They make me so happy. He makes me so happy. He feels like home to me. If we don't make it out of this, shut up, man, we're gonna make it. If we don't, I want you to know, I feel bad about Calypso. I failed her. Leo stared at him, dumbfounded. You know about me and- The Argo too is a small ship, Percy grimaced word got around. I just... Well, when I was in Tartarus, I was reminded that I hadn't followed through my promise to Calypso. I asked the gods to free her and then I just assumed they would. With me getting amnesia and getting sent to Camp Jupiter and all, I didn't think about Calypso much after that. I'm not making excuses. I should have made sure the gods kept their promise. Anyway, I'm glad you found her. You promised to find a way back to her and I just wanted to say, if we do survive this, I'll do anything I can to help you. That's a promise I will keep. Here's the thing, I fucking love Percy Jackson. Percy Jackson's too good for this world. Percy Jackson's too good for this world. All of those things he just said should be excuses. They're all valid reasons. All he wanted after winning a war for the gods was for them to follow through on their promises to him. Him assuming that they would, completely fair. And then him maybe not checking in on that because he got amnesia and then was on a deadly quest. That's okay, that's very valid. He's a 16 year old kid. 
I wouldn't expect anything else. He's already gone so beyond that by even making that promise in the first place. He shouldn't feel bad about this. He just shouldn't. And I honestly hate that Rick is actually framing it as if Percy is in the wrong. It actually bothers me. Man, what is your problem? Look at the grumbles. Percy blinked. So I guess we're not cool? Of course we're not cool. You're as bad as Jason. I'm trying to resent you for being all perfect and hero -y and whatnot. Then you go and act like a stand-up guy. How am I supposed to hate you if you go to apologize and promise to help and stuff? A smile tugged at the corner of Percy's mouth. Sorry about that. Percy Jackson, best man ever. Percy Jackson, I am literally in love with you. Spare hand in marriage, please. You are the best person ever. Ah, uh, not me actually getting emotional about how much I love Percy Jackson now. Oh no. Oh no. I might cry. I'm gonna be honest, just hearing and having this dream sequence about Kyron and Clarice and Rachel and Will and everyone discussing war tactics and how they're gonna defend camp, sitting around in the big house. It makes me wish that we were reading about that story. It makes me wish we were at camp and we were defending camp and we were there with the usual crew. I'm very open about the fact that the first series is my favourite. While I love Heroes of Olympus, it does read like fan fiction a lot to me and I almost wish we didn't have it. My heart lies with that first series. What feels like home to me more so and what is so comforting. What I love about this series is what camp feels like there. And it's Percy and Annabeth and Grover and Clarice and Kyron and everyone at camp. But while I love Leo and Piper and Jason and Frank and Hazel. And obviously it's so incredible to have more Percy and Annabeth content. This series just doesn't really hit the same because we're not spending it at camp. Sorry, ignore Percy scratching in the background. It would feel repetitive if we were reading a series that was too similar to the first one. I wish it felt a little bit more like the first series, I'm gonna be honest. I wish I could use any of my father's gifts to stop this war. He looked down in his own hands with distaste. Unfortunately, I'm just a healer. Healers are literally the most important people on a battlefield. My dream superpower, being able to heal other people. Hades just fully accepting Nico for who he is. Yeah, that meant a lot to me as a kid. I hope that Nico is an exception. He gets to be happy too. I really do. We still haven't necessarily seen it, but I still have hope. I stand by the fact that Hades is the best of the Olympian parents. If you have to have one, obviously there's some other baggage that comes with being a Hades kid, but in terms of the parenting itself, I think Hades is probably not as, maybe not the best, but the least horrible is a better phrasing. He wanted to hate Annabeth, but he just couldn't. She was genuine and sincere. She never ever looked him or avoided him like most people did. Why couldn't she be a horrible person? That would have made it easier. Nico D'Angelo not hating Annabeth Chase just makes me happy. She is genuine and sincere. She's not a horrible person. Does someone want to let Book Talk know? He looked at the silver pocket knife in his hand. An idea came to him. Probably the stupidest, craziest idea he'd had since he thought, hey, I'll get Percy to swim in the river sticks. He'll love me for that. Nico, baby. <laughs> That's me telling like normal people who I'm into who I've never read these books and have no idea the connotations be like I'll tell them I'll fall into Tartarus for them they'll love me for that like that gay delusion me too Nico. <laughs> she gave him a hug which seemed to fluster him but Piper couldn't help liking Frank me too um everyone loving Frank in 2021 hell yeah that didn't make sense I'm getting tired mostly because Percy was keeping an eye on the giant red sea serpent swimming off the port side thing is really red, Percy muttered. I wonder if it's cherry flavoured. Why don't you swim over and find out? Annabeth asked. How about no? Their dynamic is everything to me. That tiny little moment feels so first series Percybeth and that's so personal to me. My point, Piper said poking his chest, is that you, Jason Grace, are very familiar with your own bad spirits and you try your best not to feed them. You have solid instincts so you know how to follow them. Whatever annoying qualities you have, you are a genuinely good person who always tries to make the right choice. So no more talking about giving up. That's such a beautiful description of Jason's character, actually. Maybe I'm becoming like a full-fledged Jason Grace then. I used to hate Jason Grace. I used to give him so much shit. I remember being very stressed that a member of the Seven was going to die, for obvious reasons, going into this book. And I remember literally venting to my mother about how the only character to, to, to death I could potentially deal with would be 
Jason's because they liked him but didn't really care that much and I was like the worst part about Jason Dyke would be Piper being sad like I'm not that attached to him oh how the tables have turned like we know why it's it's the hindsight from trials but still I love Jason Grace maybe I'm a Jason Grace stan maybe this is my Jason Grace stan era when she recounted her dream for Percy the ship's toilet exploded no way are you two going down there alone and here is Percy's unhealthy protectiveness I understand it but we see it here and he works on it. I wish it was explored more. I wish they were given POVs, but that's fine. Seaweed Brain, are you implying that two boys can handle this better than two girls? No, I, I, I mean, no, but Annabeth kissed him. That has the same energy of, so who's your dad? He's a history professor. He's human, but I thought my mom is Athena, goddess of wisdom, sexist much? No, I love girls. I mean, I think they're very nice. Capture the flight is- I'm so sorry. <laughs> Not me knowing all the dialogue to the Flight and Give Musical. Fun fact, I have had audio bootlegs um, of the Flight and Give Musical since 2017. I had like three from the original off-Broadway production and then um, I had lovely friends who would take audio bootlegs when they saw it on tour for me and then I had some from Broadway as well. So I just have this like extensive back catalogue of like audio bootlegs of the Lightning Thief musical and back when I was in school my commute to school was like an hour and a half each morning and each afternoon and I would just listen to like the whole musical there and back so I have like the whole thing memorized like all the dialogue <laughs> imagine being normal he seems to be adjusting Piper said he's smiling more often you know he cares about you more than ever. I know that this isn't like a really romantic quote that he cares about her because they went through something deeply traumatic but also does someone want to care about me that way? I have an Annabeth Chase complex. Does anyone want to be my Percy? Come on. <laughs> I want to believe we can have a normal life someday but I allowed myself to hope for that last summer after the Titan War. Then Percy disappeared for months and then we fell into that pit. Piper, if you'd seen the face of the god Tartarus, all swirling darkness devouring monsters and vaporizing them. I never felt so helpless. I try not to think about it. This is what breaks my heart so much about Tartarus. This is why the moment when they fall in Mark of Athena still affects me so much, even though I know that scene through and through, because I know that it leads to this, and I want better for them. They deserve better than this. Annabeth doesn't deserve this. Percy doesn't deserve this. They deserve the future that they hope for. Piper McLean, she rumbled. That was, without a doubt, the dumbest risk I've ever seen anyone take. And I date a dumb risk taker. What if you dated two dumb risk takers, Annabeth? You clearly have a type. You're in love with Piper too. It's okay, we can say it. Date both of them. You have two hands, use them. Annabeth shivered. Panic and fear, Percy met them once on Staten Island. I love a reference to the Demigod Files. I love people referencing things that happen in the Demigod Files or the Demigod Diaries. It makes me so happy, it makes me feel so validated because I love those books. Those little, like, the interviews with the characters in the Demigod Files and all the short stories, all the mini stories. Absolutely everything to me. And I am here to make you believers. And then I saw her face. <laughs> No, I'm gonna go jump out of a window. You can't think your way out of your emotions. I feel a little bit called out by that. No thank you, Piper. Piper cupped her friend's face. She pulled Annabeth forward until the foreheads touched. Through her fingertips, she could feel Annabeth's rapid pulse. Fear can't be reasoned with. Neither can hate. They're like love. They're almost identical emotions. That's why Ares and Aphrodite like each other. Their twin sons, fear and panic, were spawned from both war and love. But I don't. This doesn't make sense. No, Piper agreed. Stop thinking about it. Just feel. Friendly reminder that Piper and Annabeth canonically do the forehead touch. Happy Pride Month. Fear and love really were related. At that moment, she clung to the love she had for her friend. Friend. When they gal pals. Annabeth just being terrified and feeling like she needs a logical way out of the situation she needs to think it through rather than just go by her feelings i really relate to that and i hate it all right i said i wasn't going to read much i just read 200 pages so i'm gonna stop there because i'm getting sleepy this is my least favorite book of heroes of olympus by far but i feel like an idiot for you know being scared to start it or like not wanting to start it because i am enjoying it greatly i have more motivation to keep reading it now which is great anyway i'll see you soon Inko was devastatingly alone 
He lost his big sister Bianca. He had pushed away all of the demigods who tried to get close to him. His experiences at Camp Half-Blood in the Labyrinth and in Tartarus had left him scarred, afraid to trust anyone. Raina doubted she could change his feelings, but she wanted Nico to have support. I love Raina so much as someone who kind of really relates to where Nico is at in that moment. Raina being able to recognize that and relate to that and wanting to give him support is really, really sweet and I love that a lot. Raina grabs the knife and strangles her, pressing the blade against her captor's throat. I wish I was Talia. God, I wish I was Talia. Raina, do you want to straddle me and hold a knife to my throat? Come on, babe. <laughs> Prior to Trials of Apollo, I was a massive Raina and Talia shipper. I'm not gonna lie to y'all. They had a grip on me that I cannot explain. I shipped them so much. Of course, Raina understood why her sister was such a chameleon. If she kept changing, she could never fossilize into the thing their father had become. Why do I kind of relate to that a little bit? Always happens with men. They promise friendship. They promise to treat you as an equal. In the end, all they want is to possess you. Obviously, this is a very extreme case and I don't think this is true for everything, but like that is the same energy as kind of TikTok that a lot of girls make, which are very true about being very excited to find like strong male friendships because a lot of the time with women, male friendships do end with them catching feelings and then getting angry at you because you let them on when you were just being a friend to them. This isn't true for like every male friendship I've had, but it's ha it's happened and it happens to a lot of people. That sentence just reminds me of like those TikToks of people being like, bitter about that. You knew Orion would be right behind me. You were setting up an ambush. I'm the bait. The other girls will find somewhere else to look besides Rena's face. Please, Rena tried to Don't develop a guilty conscience now. It's a good plan. How do we proceed? Love of my life. She is everything I want to be. Piper and Annabeth were trying to save the rigging. Since Sparta, they'd become quite a team, able to work together without even talking, which was just as well since they couldn't have hurt each other over the storm. It's because they're girlfriends. It's because they are in love. It's okay, I can speak my truth. It's because they're girlfriends. Okay, Percy said, well, just don't get knocked unconscious. Shut up, Jackson. Percy grinned. Percy being able to make fun of Jason getting knocked out all the time, I love to see it. And here's the thing, again, I was complaining a little bit earlier about how Jason does spend so many fights knocked unconscious because I don't think Rick knew how to write his character. The fact that Rick frequently writes jokes about how much Jason gets knocked out during fights means that he's well aware that this is something he's doing. It feels like a choice and again it feels like Rick just doesn't really know how to write Jason in a fight and actually make him feel as strong of a player as Percy. And so he just avoids having to do it where he can. Minor goddess? Minor? By which, Jason said quickly, he means under the drinking age because obviously you're so young and beautiful. That's actually a really good save. <laughs> well done, Jason. Something that I really love about this chapter is we get to see Jason not using brute force, but using his intellect and intelligence and honestly like his compassion to win a fight and just literally persuade a goddess to be on his side and fight with him even though she's getting a pretty good offering from Gaia. It's really interesting to me and I think that that's where we see Jason shine because I think Jason works more as an empathetic character than as a hero who uses brute force and brute strength. So getting to getting to see him use that in action in, in a fight here, I think. It shows how cool Jason can be. I think I am in my Jason Grace Stan era. Oh my God. 12 year old Ashley never would have thought this would happen. Thing is, as I was choking just now, I kept thinking, this is payback. The fates are letting me die the same way I tried to kill that goddess. And honestly, a part of me felt I deserved it. That's why I didn't try to control the giant's poison and move it away from me. That probably sounds crazy. Friendly reminder that Percy Jackson is canonically a little bit suicidal and we never really delve into that or explore that. We never, ever see Percy working through that trauma and getting to a healthier mental place. We never see that because Rick doesn't bother to give Percy and Annabeth a conclusive ending here, nor does he actually give him one in Trials of Apollo. We see Percy be like exhausted and tired and sick of the God's shit in Trials of Apollo, but we don't really see Percy work through this trauma. This is why I'm so bothered. Percy and Annabeth's story does not feel like it gets an ending. It feels like they both end up in really awful places that we don't see them work through. We don't see them working through any of that Tartarus trauma and we fucking should. This is why if Rick wants to write anything else in this universe, I'm praying that it's a Percy Annabeth and Grover story where we actually see them work through this fucking trauma and get a happy ending because we don't see them get one. And considering how long we've spent with these characters, the love that we have for these characters, especially Percy, we should see them get to that place. And it bothers me that we don't. Rick just casually dropped Percy being suicidal in here and then left it. Didn't, didn't, didn't develop it. 
it really bothers me. I'm not gonna lie, it really bothers me. Nico wasn't exactly a sunshine person. Give it a couple weeks and I think your boyfriend will disagree, bud. The bond and mutual understanding that Nico and Rena have with each other and the fact that Nico knows the right way to, to talk to Raina in order to get her to open up and he knows that he's being a little bit hypocritical expecting her to open up but he genuinely wants her to help and he wants to see her be okay and let go of her demons and he cares so deeply for her it's really heartwarming to see and it's a bond that I really really love Hades had this idea that I should you know try to act like a modern teenager make friends get to know the 21st century he vaguely understood that mortal parents drive their kids around a lot. He couldn't do that, so his solution was a zombie. I stand by what I said about Hades being the best Olympian parent. He's not perfect by any means, but he's definitely the least awful. He seems to at least really care about his kids. Nico is absolutely right though that Raina didn't kill, didn't kill her father. She killed a manifestation of what he once potentially was. She did not kill anyone, they were not human, they were not living anymore. But even if she did, that would have been not only self-defense, but defense of her sister as well. She thought she was dead. Even if she had killed him when he was still a human, she was doing it out of self-defense and self-preservation. Sometimes when you're a demigod, those things aren't, they're, they're not as simple as murder, they're not as black and white as that. She did what she had to do to survive and to protect her family and it's complicated, you know? It's complicated. And Raina didn't do anything wrong. Okay, look, Nico's powers, when we see them in action, are scary. If I saw someone just unleashing endless sorrow and pain on other people and then not being un able to understand the concept of mercy and making them forget their own identity, uh, I'd be a little freaked out by it. But the reality of it is, is Nico's powers don't define who he is as a person. If you saw Percy or Jason using their powers to an extreme rate, like you wouldn't be scared of them afterwards because you understand that their powers aren't their identity. Nico's powers just happen to be a little bit creepier because of who his dad is. And I don't think that's a very valid reason for people to fear him. And I feel like if you're a demigod, especially like everyone else at camp, you should understand that Nico as a person isn't just broody underworld guy. He eventually slowly has become that because everyone has like shunned him and excluded him from everything. Nico himself is just a kid who wants to find a place where he belongs and he deserves that. He deserves people who are going to have patience with him and take the time to get to know him outside of scary Hades kid. What I told you about my father, I'd never shared that with anyone. I guess I knew you were the right person to confide in. You lifted some of my burdens. I trust you, Nico. Nico stared at her, mystified. How can you trust me? You both felt my anger, saw my worst feelings. Hey, kid, to coach Hedge, his tone softer. We all get angry, even a sweetheart like me. Raina smirked. She squeezed Nico's hand. Coach is right, Nico. I'm not the only one who lets out the darkness once in a while. I told you what happened with my dad and you supported me. You shared your painful experiences. How can we not support you? We're friends. I love to see it. How fucking yeah, this is what I want for Nico. This is exactly what I was just saying. Yes. I love to see it. Pegasus is here. My buddy, my buddy, my buddy. My pal, my buddy, my bucky. Pegasus. Percy and Anabaptist getting gelato for everyone as little pick me up is so fucking sweet. I adore them so much. Also, them talking about pelicans makes me deeply happy. I have a really deep love for pelicans. Don't know if I've ever said this on my YouTube channel before. I really love pelicans. They just bring me joy. I see them outside of my apartment a lot and it literally makes me so happy. So hearing Percy and Anabeth talking about pelicans walking around and like stopping at the bars makes me so happy. I'll be real with you besties. I'm about halfway through this novel and I'm starting to to struggle a little bit. It's starting to drag a little bit and I'm feeling the effects of like, oh, this one's not my favorite. This one's not my favorite. Friendly reminder, Leo Valdez just casually invented a musical instrument. I forgot that Octavian was the one who ordered in the catapults. He ordered them in himself. Um, I mean, it was a very shitty thing of him to do. Karma? Annabeth pointed to the disc-shaped structure about 50 yards up their port side. There. Leo smiled. Exactly. See? The architect knows his stuff. I don't know why that brings me such joy, but it really does. I've really, really, during this reread, and I, it's never 
occurred to me that I can remember before but I've really fallen in love with the little friendship between Leo and Annabeth it's very beautiful to me that it developed from Leo being like genuinely scared of her and he still jokes about being scared of her sometimes but only really when she's angry which I'm I'm scared of everyone when they're angry so fair enough it's really developed from him being like legitimately really intimidated by her to them having this like clear understanding of each other and sympathy for each other and respect for each other and then working together it makes me really, really happy. It's obviously not a friendship that we get a whole heap of. It's just tiny moments like this. But I've really, really loved picking up on these moments as reread and in my head now they're absolute besties and I love that for them. Don't break the vial of deadly poison. Man, I'm glad you said that. Never would have occurred to me. Shut up, Valdez. Frank gave him a bear hug and be careful. Again, a friendship that I really love. The development of it makes me very happy. I love them, I love them, I love them, I love them. Jason Grace needing glasses is so personal to me. This is so stupid. But as a kid, I used to legitimately worry about whether or not I could be a demigod if I needed glasses. And Jason Grace fixed that. He gave me my answer and I felt very represented by that. Thank you, Jason Grace, for also being short-sighted. Leo silently communicating with Hazel to like, use the mist to make everyone think that Leo is given the physician to cure the Piper. Smart lad, smart, smart boy. I can't remember the first time I was reading this, whether or not I was really worried. I would imagine that I was. I would imagine that I was very upset at the fact that this book was essentially telling me Leo was going to die. I imagine the first time I read for that to have been quite upsetting, but I also don't remember it. So maybe I thought it was a massive misdirect because it's clear that he has a plan and they're also spilling it out of Leo is going to be the one to die. So it's not like it happens in the moment and you're really upset, like they're really spelling it out. So maybe I thought it was a misdirect, I don't know. I think it's also interesting how much, obviously now knowing that Trials of Apollo is a series and knowing why Apollo gets, you know, cursed to being a human, it's interesting to see how much like it's hinted at that Apollo has something, you know, tough on, uh, on his way coming forward because I never really picked up on it the first time before we knew that Charles of Apollo was a thing. I just was like, oh, that's weird how much they're kind of focusing on Apollo. I remember like noting it, but I didn't really think, oh, this will be another series. Just looking back now, I'm like, oh, Rick is really laying the groundwork down anytime Apollo was brought up at all, which makes sense. Pegasus says he's never been more touched by a demigod's compassion for a winged horse. He gives you the title horse friend. This is a great honor. Why am I about to cry? <laughs> I forgot that Ella and Tyson show up here. So I was a little like, at first I was like, oh, Octavian's being weird. Like I fully fell for it. But specifically seeing Tyson just makes me happy. Again, can you tell how happy any mention to the first series is? I clearly have a bias towards it, but it just makes me happy. <laughs> I have, I, d I didn't remember Rainbow being mentioned. <laughs> Nico had told her that Blackjack was Percy's usual ride, but he seemed friendly to everyone. He carried the son of Hades without protest. Now he was comforting a Roman. Blackjack is simply the best horse, pe best pegasi ever. That's all. So I mentioned before how I got this book like three days early um, and I read it before it was released. I read it in, the two, like, in two days before it was released, which I thought was really, really quick. I thought I was reading it super fast. Um, I was 12, I think at the time. And I thought reading like a 500 page book in two days was so much. Whereas now I would read it in like a day, um, which is quite funny. But I remember like, again, giving Taylor live text updates, but without spoilers. So I would just talk about my emotions with no context to her because I needed to rant to someone, but she was going to read the book. So I didn't want to spoil it. So I was like, can I just, text you my emotions without context and not explain anything and she was like sure and I remember this whole situation with Blackjack it was like the most upsetting part of this novel for me I remember texting her just like sobbing being like I can't do this I can't do this being like just terrified that Blackjack was gonna die and that being that was the worst case scenario for me that wasn't even a character death that I'd been worried about it didn't occur to me but I was way more attached to Blackjack as just the symbol of comfort than I had realized and so this this moment with Blackjack was like the moment in which I had the biggest breakdown. I remember texting Taylor on my iPad just during this and her having no idea. And then when she had read the book, her saying something to me being like, I really thought like one of the main characters had died there. And I was like, no, no, Blackjack. I was very worried about Blackjack. This is for Phoebe, she snarled in his ear. For Kinsey, for all those you killed, you will die at the hands of a girl. I might cry. Um, 
I might cry, I love Raina. I love Raina, that's a really powerful moment. I might have a breakdown about it. My people were the original Athenians, the Gemini. Like a zodiac sign? Percy asked. I'm a Leo. No, stupid, Leo said. I'm a Leo, you're a Percy. I think that's my favorite joke in this book that lives rent free in my mind. Every time I meet someone who's like star sign is Leo, my main instinct is to be like, no, I'm a Leo, you're a Percy. It just lives in my head rent fucking free. Annabeth caught Piper's eye. She asked a silent question. What's your feeling? Piper still wasn't used to that, the way Annabeth looked at her for advice now. Ever since Sparta, they've learned that they could tackle problems together from two different sides. They are in love, they are girlfriends. That soulmateism is what that is. Annabeth saw the logical thing, the tactical move. Piper had gut reactions that were anything but logical. Together, they either solved the problem twice as fast or they hopelessly confused each other. Soulmateism, that's, they're perfect together. Soulmateism, that also kind of does remind me of how Annabeth and Percy work together as well. I think the way that Annabeth and Piper work as a team is kind of similar to how Annabeth and, and Percy work as a team, just in the sense that Annabeth is logical and Percy or Piper are not. <laughs> They're a bit chaotic. The inclusion of Piper's like singing charm speak is so interesting to me. One that makes me fall in love with her even more. I think I've said this in a video before. I might not have. I say very frequently that I don't have like a type in the people that I'm interested in. They're, they're all have been very, very different human beings. The one thing that's common in not all, but about 80% of the people I've had feelings for in my life, they're really good singers because the idea of singing like Disney duets with someone, god tier. So the fact that Piper is a really good singer makes me fall even more in love with her. But I also just think that the idea of Charm Speak being even more powerful when it's melodic and when it's sung is, is really interesting and it reminds me of like myths about sirens and stuff which I love. Oh my god, myths about sirens are like my favourite kind of myths and hello the siren scene is like my favourite part of Sea Monsters. And the idea that people could like put other people in like a trance because of just the way that they're singing is such an interesting concept to me and such an interesting mythology and I love it and I love that we that that's what Piper's charm speak developed into I love that we see like singing charm speak with her it's really cool Annabeth slipped her hand into Percy's which made Piper feel downhearted because you're in love with her because you're in love with Annabeth it's okay babe I understand I see you you, you listen to She by Dodie and you cry about Annabeth. It's okay, we've all been there. The others squatted next to her. Percy handed her a canteen of water. This is such a silly little thing, but that's such a gesture of kindness. Piper didn't even realize how thirsty she was, but Percy recognized that and just offered her water, even though Percy and Piper don't really know each other, but he's just observant and, and kind. Fuck Percy, that's such a tiny little thing, but it just shows how good of a friend Percy Jackson is, and I literally would both die for him and kill for him and eat glass for him. Percy's gaze became unfocused. His lower lip quivered. My mom, I, I haven't even seen her since Hera made me disappear. I called her from Alaska. I gave Coach Hedge some letters to deliver to her. I, his voice broke. She's all I've got. Her and my stepdad, Paul and Tyson, Annabeth reminded him, and Grover, and yeah, of course, Percy said, thanks, I feel much better. I love Percy talking about his family, but I also really do love that Annabeth is popping in and being like, hey, you have more family. She recognizes and knows deeply how important Sally and Paul are to him, but she's like, hey, they're not all you've got. There are so many people who love you. And her just calling Percy out on that also shows that she knows Percy really well and understands how alone he feels. And she knows it's probably very important to him that she points out how many people love him and how many people need him and and care about him and are proud of him. When you think back to Percy and Good Kid, right? Let's use the musical as an analogy because we've been nowhere with the Lightning Kid musical. Think about Percy and Good Kid and all I need is one last chance to prove I'm good enough for someone. Here is Annabeth literally listing the people he is good enough for. And it just makes me happy. Percy has come so far and I love him so much. After all I've been through in the past year, it seems stupid that I resented them for so long. Um, Annabeth, I'm gonna have to disagree on that one. After everything you've been through in the past year, it seems more valid than ever why you resented them for so long. Now know more so about what your stepmom put you through when you were a seven year old than we ever have before. Um, I think it's more valid than ever that you resented them for so long. I think you should still resent them. 
I've said this before, I will say it again, I don't think Annabeth's family are necessarily worthy of her forgiveness. I love the idea that they're trying to to bridge that gap and, and everything, but I also feel like Annabeth's family did, hasn't really taken accountability, at least from what we've seen, for everything they put her through as a kid and the fact that they were very much so in the wrong there. I think they need to do that in order for her to really, in order for them to deserve her making an effort or engaging in them making an effort now. And my dad's relatives, I haven't thought about them in years. I have an uncle and cousin in Boston. As he looks shocked, you with the Yankees cap, you've got family in Red Sox country. I know that's not weekly. I never see them. My dad and my uncle don't get along, some old rivalry, I don't know. It's stupid what keeps people apart. Just a little, little Easter egg to my second favorite ride in the series. <laughs> Sorry, they've just seen the trident marks and I know what that means, it's coming. <laughs> Fuck, I'm gonna cry, I'm gonna cry, I'm gonna cry, I'm gonna cry. Oh god, okay. I'm fine, I'm fine. Okay, I can read this, it's fine. So, this is where the rivalry started, Percy said. Yeah. Percy pulled Annabeth close and kissed her. Long enough for it to get really awkward for Piper, though she said nothing. She thought about the old wall of Aphrodite's cabin, that to be recognised as a daughter of the love goddess, you had to break someone's heart. Piper had long ago decided to change that rule. Percy and Annabeth were a perfect example of why. You should have to make someone's heart whole. That was a much better test. When Percy pulled away, Annabeth looked like a fish gasping for air. The rivalry ends here, Percy said. I love you, wise girl. Annabeth made a little sigh, like something in her ribcage had melted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's all I want. I love the analogy of needing, wanting to make someone's heart whole like they do for each other. That's everything to me. I hate that Rick describes her as looking like a fish gasping for air. It really really isn't the right tone for the for the moment it's always bothered me could you not have described her any other way why did that need to be included but whatever the fact that he says i love you wise girl and the rivalry ends here but also the fact that we got that through piper's perspective not percy or annabeth's actual bullshit i will never stop being salty about that we heard percy say i love you for the first time through piper's pov not percy's not annabeth's even it should have been percy's but not even annabeth's piper's Okay. Hello, it started getting kind of dark, so we've moved to my reading spot and we have a ring light so that as the sun descends through the window, you'll probably be able to see its progress. Um, you can still see my face. Percy remaining pretty calm when they're threatening him, but as soon as they look at Annabeth, he like explodes like a just water somewhere. He just is filled with anger and like lets out a yell. I'm sorry, my cat scratching, but mm, kind of everything to me okay hello i found a better angle so we're here now but hi <laughs> she tried to grab annabeth but despite her bad leg annabeth was holding her own that's my girl that's my girl literally just been stabbed in the leg nearly stabbed like to death no still got a pretty decent leg wound is very aware that her blood is halfway to rising you know gaia but she's still holding her own she's still literally holding her in a fight against a fucking giant I'm an Annabeth Chase Stan first and human being second. Look, the fact that Percy Jackson having a nosebleed is what kind of like caused Gaia to rise is, look, it's kind of funny, but it's also a bit disappointing. Like, I don't know, everything about the finale of this book, of this series feels really like anticlimactic. It being Percy having a nosebleed does feel a little anticlimactic. It's kind of like, oh, you could have done something cooler with this. You could have done something where I was actually worried about Percy's well-being or Annabeth's well-being because she gets away pretty easily too. You know, they could have been in more danger. The stakes could have been much higher and I wish they were. Sure, Nico had mixed emotions about the camp. He had felt rejected there, out of place, unwanted and unloved. But now that it was on the verge of destruction, he realized how much it meant to him. This was the last place Bianca and he had ever shared a home. The only place it ever felt safe, even if only temporarily. Ouch. I am in pain, Stitch. I am in severe emotional pain. I am distraught. If he could assassinate Octavian, that might solve the problem. The order to attack might never be given. Nico D'Angelo just trying to justify assassinating Octavian. I love you. Sir, I love you. He spun, his sword instantly in his hand, and almost decapitated Will Solace. Put that down, Will Hiss. What are you doing here? Nico was dumbstruck. Will and two other campers were crouched in the grass, binoculars around their necks and daggers at their side. They wore black jeans and t-shirts with black grease paint on their face like commandos. Me? Nico asked, what are you doing? Getting yourselves killed? Will scowled, hey, we're scouting the enemy. We took precautions. You dressed in black, Nico noted, with the sun coming up. You painted your face but didn't cover that mop of blonde hair. You might as well be waving a yellow flag. 
and one of the greatest ships in the right and versus born. He took Nico's hand, which sent an electric current down Nico's spine. I love them. 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 I've, not, I've had them for three seconds and I love them. But if you're planning to shadow travel to that command tent, forget it. Nico glared at him. Excuse me? He expected Will to flinch or look away. Most people did. But Will's blue eyes stayed fixed on his, annoyingly determined. Coach Hedge told me all about your shadow travel. You can't try that again. I just did try it again, Solace. I'm fine. No, you're not. I'm a healer. I could feel the darkness in your hand as soon as I touched it. Even if we made it to that tent, you'd be in no shape to fight. But you wouldn't make it. One more slip and you won't come back. You are not shadow traveling. Doctor's orders. I love Will. Thank you for looking out for Nico. Thank you for caring about Nico. God bless your soul. One of my favorite jokes in Trials of Apollo, like, is kind of a callback to this, in which Nico's like, I get to sit at whatever table I want, um, because I have a note from my doctor, and, like, Will is his doctor. <laughs> oh, please. Will sounded unusually angry. Nobody at Camp Half-Blood ever pushed you away. You have friends, or at least people who would like to be your friend. You pushed yourself away. If you'd get your head out of that brooding cloud of yours for once enough, Octavian snapped. Will, I love you. I would lay down my life for you. Will really is just this positive ray of like bubbly sunshine. And I know that's so cliche to say about, um, about an Apollo kid, but he's so optimistic and caring and he's observant and he just is so kind to everyone. And he just like lights up every room he walks into and every page he's on. And I adore Will Solis. I really, really do. And I wish we got more time with him because he really only becomes like a character we really get a personality for realistically here and then we see him quite quite a bit in trials but like still i would have liked more of him because i really love him as a character we're overleading all the sages and nature spirits i miss him so much i miss him so much jason had heard of someone's life flashing before his eyes but he didn't think it would be like this standing with his friends in a defensive ring surrounded by giants then looking up at an impossible vision in the sky Jason could very clearly picture himself 50 years in the future. Mm, that was really painful. That really, that really hit. That really hurts, actually. That really is quite painful. I don't want praise, Jason's voice quavered. Just a little time together would be nice. I mean, I don't even know you. Deuce's gaze was as far away as the ozone layer. I am always with you, Jason. I have watched your progress with pride, but it will never be possible for us to be. He curled his fingers as if trying to pluck the right words out of the air. Close. Normal. A true father and son. That's bullshit. I'm sorry. If the gods wanted to, they could. The gods could be good parents if they wanted to. They fucking choose not to and make excuses and then act sympathetic in front of their kids. I don't agree with any of Luke's actions, but I do agree that the Olympians should be, like, overthrown. They're clearly not very good rulers. That doesn't mean that their children have to make those same mistakes, but... I don't know, I feel like they probably shouldn't be the leaders anymore either. The gods fighting with their kids should also be the most incredible part of this series. The fact that Annabeth and Athena are fighting together in Percy and Poseidon and Hazel and Hecate with Hades or Pluto, whatever's help. That should be such an incredible moment and it's just breezed over. We do not focus on it at all. The only interaction, we get like a few mentions of each character, one mention of each character actually, and then we see Jason and Zeus. I want to see Annabeth and Athena. I want to see that dynamic more than anything. It pisses me off how much that's just breezed over. It really bothers me. This book has some of the most interesting concepts in the entire series and it doesn't feel like any of them are fleshed out or executed well and it's upsetting. Hera, do not dare take credit. You have caused at least as many problems as you've fixed. Thank you. Thank you, Zeus. I fucking hate your guts, but correct. We will speak of your punishment later. For now, you will wait on Olympus. Zeus flicked his hand and Apollo turned into a cloud of glitter. I mean, it wasn't the worst punishment. I'll be honest, he's all right. He turned out better. Dragon Frank veered to the left with Annabeth in one claw yelling, let's get him, and Percy in the other claw screaming, I hate flying. Those are the two loves of my life. Those are the two characters that I try to model myself after and make proud every single day. Those idiots. Greeks, Percy yelled, let's. Uh, to find stuff. This is why the Greek camp is superior. This is why the Greeks are superior. I want to be at Camp Half, but I do want to do not want to be with Camp Jupiter. I would be fighting with the Greeks. That is my kind of battle cry. He was about to take off, and Percy yelled, "Wait! Frank can fly the rest of us up there. We can all no man." Jason said, "They need you here. There's still an army to defeat. Besides the prophecy, he's right. 
friend group to Percy's arm. You have to let them do this, Percy. It's like Annabeth's quest in Rome or Hazel at the Doors of Death. This part can only be them. See, that makes sense. That makes complete sense. I am fine with this moment focusing on Jason Piper Leo, on just being them. But did you really have to not give Percy and Annabeth any POVs in this book? Could you not give us any like content of them actually healing and processing the Tartarus trauma and giving us a happy ending for them that feels conclusive at any point in this book and still have had that message be there? See, so, uh, it took maybe four pages for that actual fight with Gaia to happen. Piper literally said maybe five sentences to her and she fell back asleep and then Leo quite easily, I mean he had to sacrifice himself, but still quite easily just exploded her. That was, that was the whole thing. All right. <laughs> the thing is I have no emotional attachment because I know how this book ends. I don't, I'm not worried. I'm not upset about it. That has no emotional impact because I know that he's fine. And like everyone knows that he's fine because we've already talked about the physician's cure. We've already established that he has a cure for death. The question is whether or not it works, but like it's a fucking kid's book, so it's gonna work. We already know that. So we're not upset over this. And it's super anticlimactic and disappointing. I'm sorry. It's just a fucking disappointing ending. I don't like being mean to these books, but this is a letdown. I'm sorry. The fact that the only death we have here is Octavian is bullshit. The only death we have is like one of the lesser villains. Think about the last Olympian. Think about Beckendorf right at the beginning of that novel and then Selina and then, oh my God, every other camper who got killed, every, every camper who disappeared. Think about how many lives were lost in the last Olympian, how high those stakes were. That felt like a war, that felt scary. You were genuinely worried about your favorite characters. You were worried that people you really loved were going to die and people we did really love and have an emotional attachment to did die in that series and in that book. That was a beautiful ending where it was painful and we lost so many lives. It was, you know, the same as like Deathly Hallows or something where yes, you're very upset at characters you love dying, but the emotional impact of them dying is what's important. It's what makes the story feel, it's, it's what makes the win and the ending feel so victorious because you've lost something along the way. We haven't here. This is something that Rick got a lot of criticism for and I think fair enough. I was someone who criticized him for it because as much as I would hate for any of these characters to die, it would be upsetting. This doesn't feel like a victory because we haven't lost anything along the way. Raina, Annabeth and Piper were inseparable, roaming the camp as a trio to check on the progress of the repairs. That makes me so freaking happy. That makes me so freaking happy. Raina, Annabeth, Piper, Hazel, Rachel, all besties. I love strong female friendships in these books specifically because early on, um, they're, they're not like misogynistic, but like there's a very much so like, every female character feels a little bit like, I'm not like other girls -y. And you know, you have that with, in the first series, Annabeth and Selena get along and occasionally Annabeth and Clarice will. Um, but the only real solid female friendship we see is Clarice and Selena. And obviously we don't see that much of that and she dies. The most we see Annabeth interacting with another girl is Rachel, which obviously doesn't end the best. So just having like, specifically Annabeth, but every like main character, just having like strong female friendships, it, it just makes me happy. It warms my cold dead heart. She gave Nico a big hug and the crowd roared with approval. For once, Nico didn't feel like pulling away. He buried his face in Raina's shoulder and blinked the tears out of his eyes. You will not mind if I cry. Nico telling Frank to be good to his sister. <laughs> I'm staying, Jason blinked. What? I came half blood. The Hades cabin needs a head counselor. Have you seen the decor? It's disgusting. I'll have to renovate. And someone needs to do the burial rites properly since demigods insist on dying heroically. Nico D'Angelo feeling like he has a place where he belongs. I might actually cry about this. I might actually stop crying. It's fine, I'm fine. So where were you? Will demanded. He was wearing a green surgeon shirt with jeans and flip flops, which is probably not standard hospital protocol. What do you mean? Nico asked. I've been stuck in the infirmary for like two days. You don't come by, you don't offer to help. I, what? Why would you want a son of Hades in the same room with people you're trying to heal? Why would anyone want that? You can't help out a friend? Maybe cut bandages, bring me a soda or a snack or just a simple, how's it going, Will? You don't think I could stand to see a friendly face? I love them. I told you, no more underworldly stuff, doctor's orders. You owe me at least three days of rest in the infirmary, starting now. Nico felt like a hundred skeletal butterflies are resurrecting in his stomach. Three days? 
I, I suppose that would be okay. <laughs> We're going to spend our senior year together, Annabeth explained, here in New York, and after graduation, college in New Rome. Percy pumped his fists like he was blowing a track horn. Four years with no monsters to fight, no battles, no stupid prophecies. It's me and Annabeth getting our degrees, hanging out at cafes, enjoying California. And after that, Annabeth kissed Percy on the cheek. Well, Raina and Frank said we could live in New Rome as long as we like. These bitches are really just like planning their whole life together. College, everything after. It makes me so happy. They're so in love. They're soulmates. They're everything to me. <laughs> oh, they love each other so much. The fact that they don't even make it to New Rome before like fucking prophecies and monsters become a problem again is upsetting, but like they're so happy and so in love and they're planning their whole future together. So, Nico said, since we're going to be spending at least a year seeing each other at camp, I think I should clear the air. Percy smiled away, but what do you mean? For a long time, Nico said, I had a crush on you. I just wanted you to know. Percy looked at Nico, then at Annabeth, as if to check that he'd heard correctly, then back at Nico. You, yeah, Nico said, you're a great person, but I'm over that. I'm happy for you guys. You, so you mean, right, Annabeth's grey eyes started to sparkle. She gave Nico a sideways smile. Wait, I said, so you mean, right, Nico said again, but it's cool, we're cool. I mean, I see now, you're cute, but you're not my type. I'm not your type, wait, so see you around, Percy, Nico said. Annabeth, she raised her hand for a high five. Nico obliged. I think that might be the moment in this book that makes me the happiest. Annabeth has come so far in her development. The fact that she doesn't feel any jealousy there, the fact that she's not getting passive aggressive, she asks Nico for a high five. Annabeth has come so far in feeling stable and secure in her and Percy's relationship, and that is so important to me. But also just Nico being so comfortable and cool, and this is him coming out on his own terms to people, and also telling a guy that he had a crush on for years that he had a crush on him. Like, that shit's like embarrassing. Props to Nico, that's brave as hell. Like, he's so much more comfortable in who he is, and it's this first step on Nico kind of going towards a happier place, and that makes me so fucking happy. Although, I will say they're not my type jokes, not your type jokes, whatever. It used to be funny, the fandom has run them into the fucking ground. I am so tired of them. Leo Valdez, she said. Nothing else, just his name. As if it was something magical. All right, that's really fucking sweet. That's really fucking cute. All right, all right. I get it, guys. I don't have to say shit like that and make me think maybe they're cute. Hating Kalia was like a whole part of my identity. No, it's not. I'm not that dramatic. I don't really think about them that much. I just hate them when I have to read about them. The bronze dragon spread his wings and they soared into the unknown. Into the unknown. <laughs> I'm not going to try and sing it. But Elsa would be proud. Elsa would be proud. All right, that was Blood of Olympus. I still think that book is really anticlimactic. I have fun with it, I really do, because like I just enjoy the character so much in the way that Rick writes, but I think as an ending for this series, it's just super underwhelming and quite disappointing. I thought maybe my mind would get changed this time, but it really didn't. Um, I still still think it's, it's the weakest book in the series and it's a really, really weak ending. But Heroes of Olympus is done, guys. We did it. It took me fucking forever, but we're done. We finished Heroes of Olympus. I apologize for how long these reading books took me to get finished, but I hope that you enjoyed them in the end. I'm not gonna go straight into reading more Ride Invest series, but I think I definitely do wanna do reread vlogs for The Kane Chronicles and Magnus Chase as well. I'm not sure which first, but at some point I'll do those. But I think I wanna take a break and make some other videos, read some other books for a little while. To not get burnt out on this series, because sometimes that happens when I read every one of them together. Thank you for coming on this journey with me. Um, if you've been rereading with me, uh, how did you feel about this? How do you feel, guys feel about Blood of Olympus in general? Please let me know. I love chatting to you guys in the comments. It's the absolute like best part about making these videos, honestly. Like just talking to you guys in the comments makes me so happy. So if you want to chat with me about this these books, feel free to. I love you very much. Thank you for being here. I will see you soon. Mwah.